Hi, I'm Caroline, a teacher who for many years has spent her school holidays exploring the globe. In 2019, I'd booked a trip to Spain and Portugal for 2020's October half term. But without the luxury of being able to combine two weeks of quarantine with working from home, I sadly had to cancel the trip. Determined to still get out and experience some adventures, I've planned a number of day trips from my home in South London, some in London's suburbia and some in the counties just outside of London. In today's episode, I'll be walking along the Wandle Trail to the National Trust's Morden Hall Park, spotting wildlife and finding out about the fascinating history of the river along the way. Most of the trail runs along the River Wandle and this is a tributary to the River Thames, hence why it goes into it. And way back in its heyday when London was this industrial city, it's actually one of the, or potentially even the hardest working river with more than 90 mills dotted along it. And the reason why the mills were all set up alongside it was because of the enormous amounts of power that was generated because of the flowing water that would push around the water mills. There's quite a bit of history along this trail, so we're going to have a wander along to find out a little bit more about what went on along here. And also it's supposed to be steeped with lots of wildlife, you can probably hear the ducks and things in the background. So it's quite a nice green walk to be undertaking when in London. wildlife and particularly ducks and birds is what we can see around here at the moment. So a bit of a fun fact, those swans back there, it is 100% illegal in this country to kill and eat swans. The only person in the entire country who is legally allowed to kill and eat swans is the Queen. Not that I think that she necessarily does, but it's just one of those laws that's just been hung over for many centuries. Other things that you see in the wild, you know, hunting things like pheasants and rabbits and what have you, not a problem. Swans, big no-no, you'll get arrested for it. and I was actually distracted by seeing a heron and when I ducked down to be able to get a better view of the heron I then spotted this bright blue and orange kingfisher sat on a branch and it's crazy just stopping and watching it and so many people were coming past when we go away on holiday particularly to national parks loads of people when you are stop looking at something there they'll stop as well and they'll ask you know what is it that you've seen and for example in places like Yellowstone and Yosemite often you know it's things like oh there's a bear and I don't know I guess it's just the London way no one really feels like they can stop and ask a question and it's such a shame because so many people missed out on the opportunity to see what is a really beautiful bird and I've only ever seen one once before when I was in Romania in the Danube Delta and I got so excited seeing it there and yet it's crazy that we have them on our doorstep here in London.
in the main part of Bellington Park and behind me you might be able to see Carew Manor. It's been named Carew Manor because it was the Carew family who built it and lived in it for many centuries. It's got really strong links with the royal family. Both Henry VII, Henry VIII had visited and Queen Victoria I, no not Queen Victoria, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth I had visited it numerous times. Beddington Park is now what's left over from what was a much larger deer park. We're hoping tomorrow to go across to Richmond Park, which is still known for having herds of deer. It's a bit of a shame that it's gotten smaller and the deer have moved off now, but that is what this park originally once was. wildlife has seemed awfully tame almost like they've come to expect that humans will feed them which wasn't so nice but in here they're a lot more skittish and they keep on running away from us which is great to see historically this island had a train depot on it and originally they were planning on creating a canal where barge boats would be pulled by horses that would be able to take the goods that the mills along the river produced. The mill owners however didn't like that idea because it was going to be taking water away from the river and of course it was the water that when it hit the water wheels produced the power that allowed for the mills to be able to run. So the mill owners were in significant favour of having a railway instead and that's what ended up being created. It was a railway that was horse drawn similar to how it would have been if it was a canal with barge boats. And this here, this island, is the terminus. In fact, actually just listening, I can hear a train passing off to my left-hand side. So I'm guessing it probably came off of those tracks into here. I'm gonna go and take a bit of a wander and see if we can actually find some remnants of, of the, the depot tracks. Meadows. It's now managed by the National Trust and it's land that's designated to allow for our native species to grow both plants and also animals as well. But historically, if we look back to the Middle Ages, this land was owned and managed by the Delamar family. They would allow for this land to flood during the winters and the really rich silt from within the River Wandel would then make the soil a lot more fertile, allowing for the plants to grow just that little bit better. The plants that then grew were cut down for fodder and the family allowed for the local people to be able to use that as well. And then of course, once the waters had receded and all of that grass had been cut back, the land was then available for the cows to be able to graze on and live on during the warmer months. to make it 
get along to Waterloo Hall Park after a much longer walk than what we were first expecting. Like much of the trail along the River Wandle, Morden Hall Park, or back as it used to be known in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Morden Hall Estate, its prosperity relied upon the success of the mills that were here on the estate. The mills produced what was known as snuff, and this was where tobacco leaves were ground down. And it was predominantly gentlemen, but some women as well would put it onto the back of their hands and then they would sniff the snuff, giving them a bit of a nicotine buzz. Back in 1750, an eastern mill was built here on the estate, and then in 1830, a western mill was built the Garth family that lived and owned in the estate had absolutely no interest whatsoever in the mills or the tobacco business. And so three years after the second mill was built, the land in the mills got leased to a gentleman called Alexander Hatfield. He already had a tobacco factory up in central London, but in order to make his business grow into the success that it potentially could be, he wanted to be able to finish off his production line, and that meant having a mill where the tobacco leaves could get ground down. And so he moved in here, first of all renting it, but 33 years later was then able to purchase the estate from the Garth family, fully owning it. said that working in the mill was very dusty and uncomfortable. However, in comparison to a lot of other tobacco employers, they were actually quite a nice family and who treated their employees rather well. On really hot summer days when it was so sweltering and the factory conditions became especially bad, they allowed for their workers to be able to spend time working on the estate rather than being forced to work indoors. By the time of the Victorian era, snuff had fallen out of popularity, as Victorians saw it as being really rather vulgar. This was probably helped by the fact that cigars and cigarettes had become a lot cheaper and therefore most people could afford those instead. Perhaps because of the way in which the employees of the mills were treated, it went a long way to explain why, when sales were falling, that the employees who worked at the factory in central London went on strike, but those who worked here at the mills didn't. Gilead, who was the great-grandson of the original founder, he made the very difficult decision to close down the business, and in doing so, he ended up with quite a fortune. He decided to reward those loyal employees of his who didn't go on the strike by keeping them on and employing them to oversee the epic amounts of work that the upkeep of the grounds would have entailed. But still having a lot of other money and not having married, not having had children of his own, he became very philanthropic as the local area was particularly of deprived backgrounds through a lot of local school children who just didn't have the joys of being able to experience what the countryside can bring about and so forth. One day every year he would invite the local school children to come and enjoy the grounds and his employees would take the children out on rowboats and punting and there would be cakes and other stalls and at the end of the day each of the children would get to go home with a goodie bag and back in those days the goodie bag would usually consist of some kind of fruit that would have come off of some of the fruit trees such as an apple. The unexpected wildlife spotting from today will morph into slightly more expected wildlife sightings in the next video.
Along with some friendly faces, I'll take a wander through London's Richmond Park, going in search of deer at the beginning of the rutting season, and being pleasantly surprised by other surprises along the way. If you've not done so already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can join me in my autumnal adventures.